Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Breakdown with your host, Big Nick. Today, we have a very highly anticipated interview with Seattle Mariners pitcher, Matt Festa. Um, so, Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, no problem. Well, sorry, no problem. I was going to say, you know, we've uh, I've been promoting this on my page and a lot of people have been looking forward to it. You know, um, you're our second professional athlete now that we've had on. So if you don't mind, just open it up and telling us about yourself. Um, so I got drafted in 2016 uh, by the Seattle Mariners out of East Stroudsburg University in the Poconos, it's a small D2 college out there in Pennsylvania. Uh, I was very fortunate to get scouted out of there. Uh, very good conference called the Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference. Um, for those who don't really expect a lot of D2 kids to get drafted, um, that's a real big powerhouse conference. And we have a lot of ball players in the big leagues um, from that conference. So it's, it's really, um, it was really cool to get drafted out of there. Uh, I made my major league debut in 2018, uh, about a year and a half into my professional career, which some would say is fairly quick. Uh, I made the transition from starter to reliever immediately after the draft, and that kind of skyrocketed my career um, and expedited the process. And then I've had quite an eventful career. I got to go to Japan and open up, uh, made the opening day roster in 2019. Got to see and pitch in Ichiro's last professional ball game in Japan. Oh, wow. It was unbelievable. Um, I've won a couple of championships in the minor leagues, played with a lot of, lot of really good guys. Um, and now I'm working my way back from Tommy John. Yeah, and um, if, if I got it correctly here, you won the Jamie Moyer Award for Best Minor League Pitcher, correct? I did. In 2018, I was the Minor League Pitcher of the Year for the Seattle Mariners. Um, won that out of the closing role, uh, pitching in double A. And I was very fortunate to uh, pull that off. Okay, so, yeah, so, I mean, you got a lot of uh, – in you know at a young age in a short career you have a lot of great credentials and a lot of things that really shine on your resume as far as your career goes but if you don't mind let's take it back to before the majors when you were kind of when you were in high school figuring out what your future was going to be what kind of offers were you looking at coming out of high school uh for me i'm kind of a pretty cool story i have a pretty good narrative i wasn't you know highly touted out of high school um always had a talented arm and some really good stuff, but I, I was definitely a baby deer with most of my mechanics and everything. So I wasn't, I wasn't the popular guy on the team. I never made an all-star team. I didn't play on any big travel teams or anything like that. So I was very fortunate to have um, a friend of mine have some connections with colleges, Bobby Glenister, and he helped me get to just get my foot in the door at Dominican college. And that's where I, I first went to college in 2011 as a small D2, even smaller than East Stroudsburg in, uh, all, um, up in upstate New York, right by the Palisades Mall, okay. uh, a very small school. You could drive by to not even notice it. Uh, <laughs> had to try out for that team, made the team, no scholarship, no nothing, just plain try out. Um, had a really good freshman year, and I ended up getting hurt my sophomore year uh, with a little elbow injury. So I was able to redshirt. And okay. for me – I wanted to, you know, really take control of this baseball career, and I knew I couldn't develop the way I wanted to develop at that college. So I emailed the top 25 D2 schools in the country, you know, schools in Florida, schools on the West Coast, Central America, um, you know, everywhere. Didn't really get a lot of answers back except for schools in the, that Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference, and I ended up going to East Stroudsburg, um, which is really great. But, um, yeah, in high school, it was, it was kind of hard for me to get to college. Yeah, I mean that's uh that that is an interesting story. Um, we're, if I don't know if you said it, but was Dominican uh, D two school as well, or is that D three? It is a D two school as well. Yeah, much smaller one in the uh, CACC. Okay, okay. So you contribute a lot of your success, it seems like, uh, after high school to I guess your pitching coaches and a lot of your trainers. Uh, yeah. Hold on. It's it's starting to rain, so I'm gonna move inside real quick. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they just take it out. It's just like it's, Seattle, right? Yeah, I know. I, honestly, <laughs> in Seattle in the summer when I'm down there, it's kind of the best weather. It doesn't oh, really okay. start getting rainy until um, the winter and the fall. That's when the, all that rain really starts. So, all right, we're good. All right. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I guess – so 
you said you transitioned yourself. Are you more comfortable in the starting role and the closing role? Or what do you think is your future as far as positioning? Um, I'm comfortable on the mound. doesn't matter what my role is. You know, as long as it falls in my hands, I'm willing to do whatever job you need me to do. Um, there was a small transition. It took me about a month to really get my routine down as a reliever because as a starter, you're used to throwing every fifth day. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I had to really get used to throwing and being ready every day or every other day. So okay. it took me about a month to really get my arm and my routine back down. Okay. And quick question. You don't have to answer. I don't want to get you in too much trouble here, but, uh, being as a closer now in the major leagues or a reliever in the major leagues, what do you feel about this new rule as you started second and extra innings with no outs? How do you feel about that? Um, well, we were, that, that rule was implemented in the minor leagues coming up. So I've always played with that rule. They, okay. They, they, they are you a fan of that? Or you, do you believe that you should have to earn that, you know, runner in scoring position? Well, the, the runner really doesn't matter. I mean, in effect, it's the same thing as having no runners on, you know, basically what's going to happen in, in the extra innings is that that runner's going to get pushed in on both sides. So you either have to somehow pull off, that runner on second not getting in mm-hmm. is fairly hard to do with three outs or just outscore the guy in the next inning. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. Um, all right. So take us to draft day. So like you said, small schools, Dominican, East Stroudsburg, um, not exactly pumping out major league arms all the time, you know, At, take us to draft day. Were you, expecting the call uh were you expecting the call earlier later what was that feeling like when you heard your name um yeah I was expecting a phone call um on draft day definitely not in the beginning of the season but towards the end of the season because I had really you know separated myself from the pack had a really good year put together some good numbers um but I never expected to go as high as I did you know they were really projecting me in the late teens early 20s talking to a lot of the teams um and The teams that I did travel to, you know, you do those pre-draft workouts. The coolest one that I went to was Seattle Mariners. They actually invite you out to Seattle. And I got to, you know, do the pre-draft workout at Safeco Field. So that was like the first time I was on a major league field. And I was like, I did really well there. I was like, man, it'd be really cool to be out here. Mm -hmm. Turns out on day two and draft day, they call me. They're like, listen, we're going to take you in the seventh. We're going to take you in the sixth, maybe. They call me in 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 the sixth. And I was like, we're taking the sixth. They ended up taking my conference rival, uh, Brandon Miller, who ended up becoming one of my best friends. Uh, he got drafted in the round before me. We split the conference pitcher of the year that year in our wow. conference. And they That's got both of us in the sixth and the seventh round. So it was really cool to come back around and kind of become teammates after battling each other for the past couple of years. Um, but, yeah, it was it was awesome to get drafted on the second day. Wow, yeah. So you So it seems like uh, since your workout in Seattle, you kind of felt comfortability and you kind of felt like that could have been a home for you. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, pretty sure I struck out three on 10 pitches, so I couldn't have done any better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, a cliche question, but I do want to ask you, going from – such domination and winning awards in the minor leagues. Uh, and like you said, even in college, just separating yourself from the pack. What is it like when you really settle into, you know, a major league game and, a, and you have to face a lineup top to bottom where there's not a lot of weak spots? What's the, what's the gap, I guess, from dominating in the minors to stepping to the major league level? Um, it's a huge gap. Um, very humbling in a way, but I've always been, you know, humble, I guess, but that'll really humble you. If you, if you're riding a big hot streak into the major leagues and all of a sudden your first batter is Nolan Arenado, which was my first at bat in the big leagues. And, How'd that go? Uh, he got a single off me on the first pitch. His slider off the plate is a good pitch. Okay. <laughs> Our guy singly just flicked it, threw it off the plate, striked a ball, leans out, just pokes it. I'm like, all right, this is how this is going to go, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's the, that's the most important part. That gap is, you know, a, a veteran uh, pitching coach once told me that, you know, back in the day in the eighties is much harder to make it to the league and much easier to stay. 
Yeah. In today's game, he feels, in his opinion, that it's much easier to make it and much harder to stay. And that, that seems to be the fact, you know, it's really hard to stick, especially as a reliever. You really get to separate yourself from the pack. And building that confidence out on that mound and proving to your teammates and your manager and your organization that you can go out and compete on a daily basis and they don't got to worry about what your production is going to be day in and day out, that's the separating factor. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, myself on a much, much less of, de- of a degree, uh, when I transitioned from high school to the Division three level, it mm-hmm. was a wake-up call. I actually, it's a funny story really quick. My first pitch of the fall season, I opened up, you know, uh, you know, I came in in the middle of a, of a ball game and, you know, get me over fastball. What else is a freshman going to do? It got, right. I swear to God, it got hit 415 feet. <laughs> My coach yeah. wasn't even mad. He just started laughing. <laughs> what do you and, do? He's like, this is, the best, this is the best lesson for you, you know? Yeah, I mean, so like you're saying, you, you feel like you had a nice slider on the outside corner to Nolan and he just pokes it the other way. It, it is a wake up, you know? And it's just, it is that difference of you go from being the guy to, just another one and having to prove yourself. And that's what I'm transitioning into for my next question is how do you prove yourself to the veterans in the locker room and to the, you know, the coaching staff where they want to call your name in a big spot? Uh, Well, one of the things I do best is kind of instill personally myself, I instill a confidence on the mound. So like right off the bat, that was one of the things that, you know, my teammates and my coaches noticed, um, especially at the big league level, you know, um, I have a very strong mentality when it comes to like, I never really notice what's going on. You know, the mound is still 60 feet away. You're still throwing over a catcher. You got to throw three strikes. It's not, the game didn't change. You know, you jog in from the bullpen to the mound. Yeah, sure. You kind of got to zone in, shut all that stuff out. It's easy for me. Um, So number one is instilling confidence on the mound. And then number two, you know, it's, it's really result oriented at that point. Like, go out and prove that they don't have to have a question mark looming over your name when they, when they call that name, you know? Yeah. And, you know, that could come from, you know, throwing a lot of first pitch strikes to not walking the leadoff batter to just getting inherited runners out, you know, as a, in the reliever role, you know, getting ahead of batters, always being ahead in the count. Those are things that are going to keep you on that mound. And if you start falling behind hitters in the major leagues, bad things are going to happen. It's guaranteed because you're going to have to come into the zone with that pitch and they're not going to miss it. Yeah, for sure. And um, you're a New York guy, correct? Absolutely. So have you uh, had an opportunity to pitch at the stadium yet or over at City Field? I have not. I have never made it out to the East Coast yet on the travel team uh, when they, whenever they travel over. The furthest east I've gotten has been uh, Chicago. Oh, okay. Wrigley? Well, no, uh, you're, no. you're in uh, the AL. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like you said, it's just that transition has to be, uh, you know, tough to, you know, earn the respect of the locker room and of the clubhouse. So how do you feel now heading into, you know, how's your, how's your recovery going heading into this next upcoming season? Uh, My recovery is going really well. My arm feels great. Um, Surgery is a success. The rehab isn't that bad. Honestly, it's uh, tedious. If I were to say that would be the hardest part is just a lot of, you know, slow, repetitive stuff. And you got to trust the process, not yeah. rush into things. Cause you know, when you come out of surgery and you get that cast off and you get full range of motion back in your elbow, honestly, your arm feels pretty damn good to go, but you're not supposed to step on the gas real quick. Yeah, of course. Um, you got to learn to just build from the ground back up and I'm excited to see uh, all the hard work I've put in. Yeah. Um, did you happen to, uh, notice you picked up any, um, any velocity? Well, we haven't gotten to the mound yet. Okay. You haven't been off the mound. I'm about to transition to the mound in about a week and a half. And then, you know, that's a slow buildup, you know, cause I got surgery in March. It's a 12 month process. So you basically want to be max effort ready to go by March. So now I'm just going to be building up November, December, January, February, into that hundred percent intensity phase. So you're going to get on the mound and that's going to be kind of a 50 to 75% effort, you know, as best to your ability as you can and then slowly transition into max effort throwing again. Okay. And do you think you'll be ready to go for spring training? I do. I do. Okay. Cool. uh, 
very fortunate in having no setbacks and I feel very strong and my arms never felt better. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a lot of guys that I've been talking to, um, have been wanting me to ask you this. It's kind of a silly question, but what's, uh, what's a guy that since you've gotten to Seattle that you really just clicked with and had an immediate bond with as a friendship or even as just a role model and as a player? Um, for me, um, it's hard in Seattle because uh, you have so many moving parts. We've had a lot of different guys come in and out. Uh, most of the guys I've made bonds with um, were either veterans on their way out that we got during midseason acquisitions, um, like a Nick Vincent, um, guys you spend time in the bullpen, or uh, younger guys that we just picked up on the waiver wire, like a Jesse Biddle or a Matt Carris City. You know, kind of not your household names, but – you know, relievers that you still see out there floating around in the big leagues, uh, Sean Armstrong, like guys, uh, Mike Moore, and guys who just in the bullpen never made you feel like you were asking the dumb question, you know, because they know how it felt to be in your shoes. Um, and then, you know, they still mess with you. They, they, they hate you a little bit, you know, joke around with you. You're a rookie. At the time, 2018, I was the only guy up there without any time. So they had – they were just left and right just messing with me, but oh boy. <laughs> those guys um, really helped me transition easily into the big leagues because they made me feel comfortable with any question I had. Yeah, for sure. And as a competitor, I'm sure it doesn't matter to you at the end of the day, but it, you know, from an outside uh, view looking in, it, it's kind of a, you know, it's a good season to miss. I mean, this season was even just as a fan or, even just me trying to report on it uh, with the media, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess uh, in the majors. So, I mean, you know, again, as a competitor, I'm sure you don't think like that, but, you know, maybe it is a, a blessing in disguise where you got healthy, you know, you, uh, you got, a, like you said, a successful surgery, good recovery, and now you can head out and, you know, get it right for, for you know, for uh, post-injury. Absolutely. That's uh, definitely been the narrative in my head and a lot of people that I've had conversations with, you know, it's kind of like the best time to get surgery. A lot of people did get surgery along with me right around the same timeline. Um, Syndergaard, Luis Severino. Um, yeah, absolutely. A lot of those guys for sale, like, you know, they, they're just like, listen, it doesn't look like it's, a, it doesn't look like the season's going to happen. If it does, it's going to be a very odd looking season. So take advantage of the time off and maybe take care of things that might pop up down the road while you can. So it has been a blessing in disguise. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, I mean, like you said, uh, I remember reporting uh, on during the off season and it, it was at a, it was really at a point where I kind of said on my show, even, you know, we're not going to have baseball. Um, it's a shame, but we're not going to have baseball this summer. And then as we know, one day we turn on the news and boom, we had a deal ready to go, you know, and then, Obviously, Mike Trout started the thing on Twitter, uh, tell us where and when, and that mm -hmm. kind of got the ball rolling as far as, you know, getting the season underway. Yeah, it was definitely um, exciting to get baseball back with – we had nothing going. We had nothing going on, no sports to watch. So, yeah, um, even though it was a weird season, um, it was exciting to watch still. Yeah, for sure. And real quick um, – in a young locker room uh, like Seattle, what's, what's the message, you know, from the coaches to the team and what's the message from player to player as far as long-term, as far as the, the season goes? Um, the, the message with some of our veterans and obviously our coaches to most of us young guys is just take it day by day. You know, I, I once heard a, a player, I forget what team he played for, but, you know, every day is game one, 162. You know, floss whatever happened yesterday, today's a new day. And I like that mentality. So you don't really get too far ahead of yourself when things are going bad or even when things are going good. Um, and they, we know as an organization that, you know, maybe this year isn't our year. You know, we're building towards the future. We got guys in the way. Um, take these moments and these opportunities to prepare yourself for, you know, a bigger moment or take these opportunities to, you know, really absorb everything you can to make yourself a better player down the line. Yeah. Um, 
couple more questions and then I'll let you go. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Again, everyone, this is Matt Festa, Seattle Mariners relief pitcher. Um, Matt, take us through, you know, because obviously a baseball season has to be just mentally straining um, the fact that it is 162 games and a lot of traveling and, you know, a lot of off days and a lot of days where you're pitching back to back and being overworked. Take us through an MLB season and just keeping your head straight and kind of, for lack of a better term, not losing it mentally and not going off the rails mentally. How do you stay focused day in and day out over 162 games? Uh, it was definitely all helps with good teammates. You know, they make it fun. You yeah. decide to come into the clubhouse every day um, early, get in there early. I mean, most people are getting into the stadium tonight game, seven o'clock, you get into the stadium especially the young guys, at least. Getting the same, like, 12.31, you're at 1 to probably 11.30 every day. So you spend most of your life at the stadium inside that clubhouse with those guys. So when you have a really fun group of guys, it really helps the time for, uh, fly by. Um, the, MLB off season, uh, the MLB season actually has more days off implemented than a minor league season does. And the minor league season is about 140 games, which mm -hmm. is no joke either. Yeah, but absolutely. No. <laughs> travel's a lot worse. I would say, I mean, they don't, they don't call it grinding in the minor leagues for nothing. I mean, you're taking buses, you're taking buses for eight hours into another game. You know, sometimes you're driving to the night, you're not really getting good sleep, good recovery. You're not, um, you're not always sleeping in a bed. You're sleeping in the, on the bus. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, but in the MLB, it's definitely still a grind. Cause you know, you get the pressures of, the entire world paying attention to you and investing some type of emotion into, you know, your success as a team. So that also plays into the grind of the season, especially at the MLB level. Yeah. I mean, just, I could imagine just national TV uh, nightly and, you know, uh, radio locally in Seattle and even nationally, if it's a Sunday night or whatever the case may be, that could even just play a toll on anyone mentally. I mean, it takes a strong individual to, like you said, when you, when you lock in, you say, I'm still on a mound, I'm 60 feet away, you know, and to kind of just block everything out, it, it takes a lot. So I give you a lot of credit for that. Yeah, I give, I give a lot of credit to even the bigger names and the veterans, the starters um, that have to answer those hard questions every day after their starts, whether it's good or bad, and they got – nine or 10, 12 cameras in their face, at least in Seattle's aspect. I'm sure in New York, it's much worse, but in Seattle, it's like nine or 10, 12 cameras in your face, you know, after maybe you got roughed up and they got to sit there and just talk about their outing. And it's, it's sometimes brutal to watch, but I give credit to those guys and their pedigree for, you know, being a professional. Yeah. Now I know you already said you're willing to do whatever the team asks, uh, Pitching is pitching, but do you look to make a return to a starting role at some point, or do you think you've found a home in the bullpen? Um, I think I found a home in the bullpen. I uh, wouldn't be opposed to a transition to starter, but I would definitely have to um, prove myself worthy and correct the things that probably led them to the decision to transition me to a reliever. Um, it'd probably be the inclusion of maybe a better changeup, um, maybe better command with a curveball. Uh, I'm not really sure what the transition idea was for me, but whatever it was, I was willing to go along with it, you know, just for the betterment of the team and for my career. Yeah, sure. And um, real quick, just going to hop, hop back for a second through everything we just talked about. When you were uh, at East Stroudsburg, and like you said, you separated yourself, um, at what point was it where – you know, of course, school comes first, but what, what point was it where you said, okay, let me focus a little bit less on math and science, and I think I can actually get drafted and become a major league baseball player. At what point did that go through your head, and how did that affect your everyday life on a college campus? Uh, for me, I would probably be leaving my so – coming into my sophomore year at Dominican College, I had just come off like a really good summer baseball season – where I got exposed a little bit and impressed a lot of people who were like, you know, I don't really understand why you're here at this mm -hmm. school. You know, you can, you can find yourself at a better school if you really, you know, apply to yourself. And 
I ended up getting hurt that year, which is very frustrating, but that was probably when it clicked. It was after that summer coming into that fall, I was really prepared to like, you know, make a big jump. I started um, training a lot harder, um, took like the knowledge of pitching more seriously. And that was really when it clicked. And then once I recovered from my elbow injury and transferred into East Stroudsburg, it was full go. They had a great program, great strength program. Um, and it just kind of helped me along my way. So I'd probably say my sophomore year in college was when it really clicked for me. Okay. Yeah. Because, um, and not to, not to put down the bigger programs, but when you see a guy, you know, going top prospect out of, you know, going to Vanderbilt or Florida or something, I, I think it actually, it takes a lot more, uh, the path that you, that you took and it takes a lot more, you know, mental strength and physical too, to get noticed at that level, because here you are, baseball obviously was in your future and you have great stuff and you always have, I did my research on you, but you know, like we said, smaller school, um, you know, it, there, there does become a point and there does become kind of a, a fork in the road where you do say, like you said, your sophomore year, uh-oh, like I might be being a professional baseball player rather than, I don't know, whatever your major was. Yeah, my major was uh, accounting and economics, so I'm kind of glad I got to be a baseball player first before yeah. <laughs> I continued that career. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Being in that small school, it's definitely a harder path because – I will say in baseball, it's, it's easier to get noticed in these smaller schools. So it's, especially in today's world, it's not as important to hit that major program and go D1 because there's so much social media readily available. Yeah. And the thing that always got you drafted out of these smaller schools before social media and Twitter blew up was word of mouth. And as long as you have someone in your corner vouching for you saying, hey, listen, I know a guy who's in a small school. I really want you to just come take a look at him. Yeah. And scouts are willing to do that because they love those diamonds in the rough. Those are the, those are the guys that keep those, those jobs for those scouts. You know, uh, any scout could walk up to a Vanderbilt prospect and say, that guy's, that guy should get drafted. But when that scout shows up to a division three school, a division two school up in the mountains and says, listen, we got a guy that we can steal in this round. I think he's really going to help us in our organization and could develop and be something someday. The, that's yeah. the reason why those scouts have a job. Yeah, and that's and and the, those are the guys that you really find they're gonna grind and they're gonna hustle, you know, not just for themselves but for the game and for their team, you know. Um, not saying again, not saying that there's guys at the big name schools who don't. I'm sure they love the game just as much. But like absolutely. you said, you know, what's that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a truth to that. You know, you don't have to, you know, walk on eggshells. There's there's a truth to the character of someone coming out of a smaller school or. Absolutely. Area. There's a, there's a strength character to that character. And that's an important piece of the reason why you draft somebody too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, really quick, you know, how, how, uh, how did you stay, you know, because like you said, you're from New York and then you go to a school in the Northeast as well. Obviously it's not all year round. How do you, gain the I know you said word of mouth but how do you gain the attention of these scouts from all different places like for example when you were at East Stroudsburg was it maybe just Phillies and Pirates scouts over in Pennsylvania or did you guys get scouts from I don't know wherever uh, Arlington or you know Tampa Bay were they from all over the country or was it local yeah, so the way organizations work is, you know, every organization has scouts in every region. And then in each region are smaller county scouts, you know. So there's like a – there's a whole hierarchy to the scouts. So the, you can be in the middle of Pennsylvania and run into a Seattle scout or an L.A. Dodgers scout, you know. There's guys who are hired to be in that northeast region so that they, they find those guys. Um, I will say when I first got to Strasburg, uh, my first letter um, or scout letter I got was from a Phillies and a Pirates uh, scout. So yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the way the best way to get noticed, at least back then, um, and still now, is in summer ball. Um, getting onto a competitive summer ball team where now you're mixed in with guys from UNC, guys from 
University of South Carolina, friggin' University of Washington, like all over the country. And now you're playing against these in like one big super team in the summer league. That's where all these scouts go. So all of a sudden you're on the summer team and you punch out three guys from UNC or three guys from the SEC and they're like, what's this kid? I've never seen him before. And they're like, yeah, oh, who, he who's that? Dude, yeah. Down here. Now they're going to follow you for the rest of your next season and see if, you know, you're just, you're not just a flash in the pan guy who had a really good summer. Are you someone we really want to invest in? Yeah. All right. And yeah, I mean, again, thanks for coming. Uh, that's all I got for you. What's your goals for the, um, for the upcoming season as a team? Um, team, I know it's definitely playoffs, longest playoff drought um, going right now uh, for, for us. It's definitely that. Um, but maybe on a smaller scale, uh, really, you know, if that dream, if that, if that goal doesn't hit, you know, really just transition, start transitioning into a, a, a serious threat in the AL West, you know, become that new competitive team, you know, take baby steps each year to keep people on their, on their toes in that, in that division. Cause I think we did that this year. The team. Oh, absolutely. I mean, not to interrupt well. you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not to interrupt you, but absolutely. I mean, you guys were right in the mix this year. I mean, I remember about 40 games in, I looking at the wild card standings and Seattle's right there. You got a lot of young talent and a pretty, you know, it, consistency was a problem, but the offense could explode on any given day. You guys got a lot of good bats. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that, that can from, you know, just having a lot of young guys in the lineup and just, you know, taking the daily grind and the punishment of MLB pitchers each day, you know, sometimes you get beat up, sometimes you beat up on them. Um, but yeah, I think we turned a lot of heads this year and we keep turning a lot of heads with the prospects that we have. A lot of prospects are coming up, big names, really young guys. And that's why I always say, that's why I also threw in the fact that like, let's say, you know, we don't hit our goal of making, make, breaking that playoff drought. Did we bring up the prospects that we want to build and did they get their reps in to lead to maybe a 2022 2023 playoff push, like having those younger guys into these roles to get them their reps. You know, not everyone just like steps into the box in big leagues and crushes it. You know, sometimes you, you need to get a couple 50 hundred games under your belt to really transition into a serious threat. Yeah. I mean, baseball, as, as you know, I mean, and as we all know, baseball is a frustrating game. It's a game of failure, you know, and it's a process, but I think you guys are heading in the right direction. Um, I'm glad your recovery is going well. And thanks for coming on, Matt. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I love, always love talking. All right. Thanks, guys. Matt Festa, Seattle Mariners pitcher. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Thanks again.